Hello and welcome everyone to session two. My name is Melissa Lane and I'm very excited to introduce the speakers of this session featuring Professor Chandra Vikramansinghe and our very own Dr. Gary Deal. Um, following each of their presentations, we will open up a Q&A uh, to make sure our presenters have the opportunity to answer your questions. I also encourage you to take a look at their impressive bios. Weeks before the news of COVID-19 surfaced on November 25th, 2019 to be exact, our first presenter, Chandra Rikramasinghe, uh, director of the Center for Astrobiology at the University of Buckingham published correspondence in the current science uh, journal entitled Space Weather and Pandemic Warnings. I'm going to share with you a small excerpt of Chandra's uh, article as a teaser for his presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd like that. On the basis of this data, there appears to be a prima facie case for expecting new viral strains to emerge over the coming months. And so it would be prudent for public health authorities the world over to be vigilant and prepared for any necessary action. We need hardly to be reminded that the specter of 1918 devastating influenza pandemic stares us in the face from across the century. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Chandra Vic from Singhe. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very, very glad to be with you and uh, to take part in this conference, which has uh, a subject matter that is very, very, very close to my heart. In fact, the whole idea of a cosmic biosphere and indeed of astrobiology was something that I started in, almost personally myself, together with my mentor, the late Sir Fred Hoyle, in the late 1970s, already in 1982, we published arguments to say that the whole of the universe was a single connected biosphere. And in fact, we published these two uh, books, one in, one in a hardback copy and one in a pamphlet, in which we asked the question, posed the question, is life an astronomical phenomenon? Until that time, of course, there was a lot of uh, energy going in various laboratories around the world on a subject called exobiology, which was to try to, try to uh, simulate the processes that might have been involved in life beginning on the earth. So we took a, quite a different tack and we argued that life had to be necessarily a cosmic phenomenon. So my presentation over the next half hour is essentially to um, outline that story and as Melissa said, to connect the whole thesis of a cosmic, connected cosmic biosphere with the possibility of pandemic strains of viruses and so on, affecting us from time to time. Okay, so let me start in the most formal, in a more formal way with the presentation that I've got ready to show you. And so the title, Universe and Life, a Cosmic Biosphere, is the, uh, the, the grand title that I've chosen. And I want to remind you again that in, again in 1980, now two years before the date that I told you, 82, my colleague Fred Hoyle made, uh, gave a really impressive public lecture in Cardiff on the work that we were doing up to that time. And he ended in, as follows. He said, in retrospect, I find it remarkable that microbiologists did not at once recognize that the world in, into which they had penetrated had of necessity to be of cosmic order. And this is what he, I would want you to remember. And he said, I suspect that the cosmic quality of microbiology will seem as obvious to future generations as the sun being the center of our solar system is obvious to the present generation. Okay, this was in 1980. And it's 40 years now, and people are just about beginning to connect our own existence with the much bigger universe. So that's the, 
the backdrop and I want to just go ahead with what, what I had formerly got together. So life on earth can only, I, um, I argue, can only be properly understood and interpreted as a cosmic phenomenon. So that's the bottom line. And uh, uh, the further step that I want to take is to assert that life started on the earth with the arrival of bacteria, maybe bacteria and viruses from the deep cosmos. So it has nothing to do with the earth, the earth had already formed and these were just raining down on the earth. Evolution, the whole evolution of life, the pattern of evolution that leads from bacteria, plants, animals and so on, all, to, all the way to humans, uh, including pandemic diseases, all have a cosmic origin. And most importantly, and this is the strategic part that would, should be of importance to you guys, bacteria and viruses continue to enter our biosphere, mostly harmlessly, from comets and meteorites, meteors. And this is an ongoing process, it's happening as we speak. Okay, if you look at the, the, what, you rec what we all agree as the biosphere of the Earth, what everybody agrees, it uh, starts sort of 10 kilometers below the surface of the earth and extends into where that, that uh, 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 black arrow is into the troposphere at about 10 kilometers. And that's generally agreed as being filled with terrestrial earth-based living microorganisms, living uh, things. But is the 10 kilometer limit the absolute limit? or does it in fact extend to infinity? That's the question that I want to pose this afternoon, this uh, at noon your time. Well, hundreds of tons of meteoritic debris, we know, enters the Earth's atmosphere every single day. And a fraction of that ent entering debris include bacteria and viruses that actually can survive entry. They don't get heated and they don't get burnt up. They actually survive entry. And that's the incoming component. And also we must recognize that stuff from the earth, microorganisms on the earth, can also on occasion escape into space. For example, if there was a big impact on the earth like happened 65 million years ago with a huge comet, asteroid hitting the earth, uh, you get dreadful things happening on the earth, but also earth material containing uh, microorganisms be sort of splashed, splattered back into space. And, uh, and additionally, of course, we have stuff going out, spacecraft going out, and these have inevitably to be contaminated with earth microorganisms. So in 2020, in the current year of the year of the pandemic, it is becoming amply clear that the Earth's biosphere must extend into the depths of space. But how far into the space is the biosphere to be extended? And that is left to be seen. And we also know that there are possibly greater than a hundred billion habitable planets in our galaxy. And this is, these are the results of the NASA Kepler uh, telescope that's been collecting information of this kind for now nearly a decade and a half. Our terrestrial biosphere and the biospheres of other planets like the Earth, other habitable planets, must, I, I, I emphasize, must therefore be linked, inevitably linked. They are inextricably linked. Our stuff reaches them and their stuff has to reach us. But next question I want to briefly touch on is how did our own terrestrial biosphere begin? How did life really begin on the earth? Now, to answer that story, we have got to really go back to the great classical period in, in Athens, in Greece, with Aristotle, who proposed the idea that life was originated through a process that he described as spontaneous generation. And he, for example, had graphic descriptions of fireflies emerging from mixtures of warm earth and morning dew. But it's this Aristotelian spontaneous generation 
that has extended all the way to modern times and given rise to present day theories of what, are, what is called abiogenesis. Evidence from science, empirical experimental evidence has consistently challenged this as Aristotelian position throughout history. It has been continually challenged from time to time. But the first serious challenge that came to be made was in 1865 when the great biologist, the French biologist Louis Pasteur made a groundbreaking discovery, decisively disproving spontaneous generation. He showed that in these little sort of swan necked uh, flasks that you see here, he put nutrient broth in them and uh, he noticed that the nutrient broth became turbid, the microorganisms from the air fell on it and then it became it grew in the nutrient broth but when the uh, when the when the air was prevented from access to the broth then the microorganisms did not grow and the uh, his his uh, uh, t t flask did not turn turbid so microorganisms grow only when viable microorganisms already exist is what Pasteur found and this discovery I think I believe was the most important discovery of the 19th century that paved the way for panspermia and for a connected cosmic biosphere. Panspermia itself is an ancient idea. It goes back even earlier than Aristotle to a guy called Anaxagoras, a pre-Socratic philosopher called Anaxagoras, who lived from 500 to 428 BC. He proposed that living seeds, spermata, he called them, are distributed entirely right throughout the cosmos. <clears throat> but the basic concept has, uh, this basic concept of panspermia, life everywhere, has much, much older roots than even ancient Greece. I think it certainly goes back to the Vedic traditions of ancient India and probably also to traditions in uh, Babylonian civilizations around the same time. So it's a very ancient idea. Pasteur's revival of this ancient idea received a huge amount of uh, plaud plaudits and support from the most influential physicists of the time. Amongst them was a guy called Helmholtz. And those of you who studied your physics will remember the name Helmholtz. It's, uh, he's, he's a great physicist made great discoveries and he said the following, it appears to me, and this is looking at Pasteur's results, he said, it appears to me to be fully correct scientific procedure. If all our attempts fail to cause the production of organisms from non-living matter, to raise the question whether life had ever arisen, whether it is not just as old as matter itself, and whether seeds have not been carried from one planet to another. So that's what Helmholtz said in the late 1870s. Powerful as this argument was, as uh, Helmholtz and Pasteur's arguments was, at the time, spontaneous generation was very, very difficult to get rid of. It survived over decades and it survived in the form of an earth-centered theory of the primordial soup, which lasts, which lingers, I should say, it sort of staggers at the moment, even to the present day. So the idea then of, is of life emerging from a mixture of organic chemicals on the earth against what I'm going to show you are insuperable odds, huge improbabilities are involved. If you take a simplest bacterium, it's probably this is the simplest, Myco Mycoplasma genitalium, the, you have strings of amino acids, uh, DNA and so on. Take the amino acids alone. And if you take the amino acids, as, uh, sorry, the amino acids linking up into enzymes, right? And take the probability that the crucial enzymes are assembled from this broth of amino acids. You give this, the whole ocean, all the amino acids, the 20 amino acids in vast quantity, and ask how probable is it for the, the, the enzymes of Mycoplasma genitalium to be generated, and you can work, it, work that out. It's 
probabilities one in 10 raised to the thousand, right? Huge improbability, equivalent to if I give 500 people in a huge stadium, football stadium, two dice, right? With uh, six face dice, the probability of all of them in one go, 500 people throwing a double six is the improbability that is involved in getting the simplest biological system out of the simple chemicals, out of the basic chemicals. So, and the total number of atoms in the entire observable universe is only 10 to the 80. So you could forget about this, I think, and all of the efforts that have been put into um, trying to prove the, the process itself of spontaneous generation is essentially a doomed process. And in fact, it is, I think, not surprising that a full seven decades, 70 years of really high-tech laboratory work in all the most uh, influential, most well-equipped biotech labs in the world uh, have proved a dismal failure. They haven't been able to show any trend towards uh, producing a simple living system. So all this reinforces the point that the exceedingly uh, specific information that is needed to make a simple living cell cannot, I emphasize, cannot be produced by random shuffling in a warm little pond on the earth. That this earth is far too small and far too trivial of setting compared to the rest of the universe. So I shall next argue then that, give, Assuming that that is uh, granted, I shall next argue that microbial life is all pervasive in the cosmos and that life therefore must have originated in a truly vast, almost inconceivable cosmic context. And once it is originated, once it's there everywhere in the cosmos, of course, it comes down to Earth space. That's no big problem. Let's look at how life develops on the Earth. 4.5 billion years ago, the Earth had just formed from asteroids and bits and pieces striking, uh, hitting, hitting together and, and self-assembling to form this huge glowing globe of rocky material at the surface. And it would have been at this time, 4.5 billion years ago, far too hot for life or even for organic molecules to survive. There wasn't even water at the surface to begin with. Now recently, this is only three or four or five years ago, and it's been repeated, I think, in the experiment only two years ago, it's been found that the very first evidence of microbial life on the earth is there are still to be seen till it's locked away in tiny crystals of a, of a mineral called zirconium that condensed precisely 4.2 billion years ago. And these rocks are now exposed in the Jack Hills outcrop in Western Australia. The blue arrow shows the location in Australia where this rock, this rock formation is at the moment. And it's in within those rocks and in zirconium crystals, with inclusions within the zirconium crystals, that the first microbial life on the Earth was discovered. And of course, this is really very important discovery for cosmic biology, cosmic biosphere, because it puts the beginning of life to a time when the Earth was in the midst of fierce impacts. It, the Earth looked like what you see in this picture now. Right? It was almost molten rocks on the surface. So the discovery that there is traces of microorganisms at this time strongly supports the point of view that comets actually delivered life to Earth, microbial life to Earth, 4.2 billion years ago. And this, in fact, is the theory of cometary panspermia, comets bringing life onto the Earth, is the, is the gist of cometary panspermia a theory that Fred Hall and I proposed in the late 1970s, early 1980s. So to summarize what happens, the theory of complete panspermia says that primordial microbes were formed somehow, somewhere, somewhen 
in the infinite recesses of the universe very, very early on. Perhaps it, they were always there, right? Uh, depends on what kind of model of the universe you have. If you have big bangs occurring sequentially one after another, as now uh, Roger Penrose says there was a series of big bangs before the present big bang, then life might be always there as part of the universal cosmic heritage. So my primordial microbes start, are there to start with, then they go into the process of forming stars and planets, and these get amplified within warm interiors of comets and on the surfaces of planets, get thrown back, or some of it gets thrown back into, into, into intergalactic space, interstellar space. They then go through this cycle, and this cycle has been completed in our galaxy at least 10 raised to the 10 times, one for every sun-like star. So an initial legacy of cosmic life, or cosmological life maybe, is continuously amplified within the warm liquid interiors of comets and delivered into habitable planets, and that's the theory of cometary panspermia. Okay, so what is the astronomical evidence for this uh, thesis and the astronomical evidence for the biogenicity for the biological nature of dust has been something that I've been really very close to concerned with. I've seen it develop from very early beginnings and it has grown since about 1978. This is, this curve is, uh, it's a plot, the dots, the arrows and the square dots and the round dots are the first astronomical observations of the infrared absorption profile of cosmic dust sampled through a huge distance all the way from us to the near, near to the center of the galaxy and the curve was a predicted profile that we predicted ahead of the observations becoming available okay astronomical observations were after we predicted the curve and when the observations were made, and the curve is for bacteria, if the dust was made of bacteria and viruses, freeze-dried, some of them broken apart, some of them uh, sort of essentially just burnt out and so on, all of that taken, uh, taken into account, that's the, the profile, the curve is a profile that we expected. <clears throat> and the, the, the astronomical data came after, two years after that, and it sat exactly on the curve. So if you are an impartial scientist, if you find that you have a prediction and you, have, you make experiments or observations and your observations agree so precisely, you would conclude that it's QED, it's proved. But because the idea is so, so sort of controversial and disputed by a vast number of people, this wasn't as easy as that. So other data had to come along, and we had, uh, this is another example of where the points are the astronomical data, and this is called the extinction of starlight, and the curve is a prediction for bacterial model. Again, the, the fit was perfect, and in our minds, in the minds of myself, my colleague Fred Hoyle, and all the people who are really intimately involved in this, uh, process of uh, collecting data, we thought that this was the end of the story. Life is truly cosmic. Okay, and it went on and on like that. There was evidence that came from comets. Comets are these very mysterious things that people have been looking at for centuries and wondering about what it all meant. The first hard evidence of the nature of comets came when Cometalia, a very famous comet, was observed in the space age it came, Comet Halley, Halley approached the Earth, uh, came into perihelion, as they call it, in 1986. Uh, uh, and we were able to observe it in various ways. And that picture is the, um, is the spacecraft uh, image of uh, the comet, which turned out to be a black as, as a black as coal on the surface, surprising everybody, because everybody had previously thought that it's just a, 
a lump of ice, right? Inorganic, non-living ice. It turned out to be much more complex. And the stuff that was spewing out of it, again, this is on the chart on the right, we have points that are the Halley's Comet data, infrared um, data, infrared spectral data, and the curve is the prediction for a bacterial model. So already in 1986, we were making this claim that the cometary dust had a large component that was bacterial. And that had been continued, that process of identification continued for the subsequent decades, decade after decade. Giotto spacecraft instruments showed that the comet does contain high molecular weight, organic compounds that might be connected with degraded biomaterial. And a decade later, then Stardust mission came, the Deep Impact mission came, and all of these essentially corroborated the story that the material from comets is very, very likely to be connected with biology. Okay, so that's the way it was going. And then the most recent studies, of course, is only scarcely a decade ago, the Rosetta mission to the comet called 67PCG further showed that, the, uh, the, that there was evidence of liquid water below the surface, and occasionally there were very high pressures rupturing the surface crust, the ice crust and the surface, and releasing particles that look just like bacteria. Again, this is that little box is a curve for bacteria, and uh, this is the reflectivity of the surface. So complex organics relevant to life and an exceedingly dark surface was found for this comet. And so it also was fully consistent with bacteria and viruses being there in large quantity. And then in October, 2015, of course, a French group of radio astronomers reported the discovery of a profuse flux of alcohol, methyl alcohol, and a sugar in the tail of this comet called Comet Lovejoy. And, and that is from radio astronomy, from remote sensing. And of course, the amount of stuff that was coming out was prolific, equal to 500 bottles of wine per second, clearly the products of fermentation. So what else do you want? To, to, if you were going to uh, discount the theory of cometary comet plants, it's becoming very increasingly difficult. Anyway, so that's what happens. And in 2020, evidence for biologically relevant molecules were found everywhere, as I said, from planets in the solar system, interstellar clouds to the most distant galaxies, pointing clearly to a unique conclusion. Life is indeed a cosmic phenomenon. Uh, if I have a five minutes more, I'd be okay. Am I still okay, Melissa? <clears throat> you have just a, uh, we need to have question and answer here pretty soon. Uh, but yeah, just a, a few more minutes. Five minutes, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go through quickly. So bacteria and viruses, space travelers, we know that. The question that we must next ask is, can microorganisms survive conditions in space and survive long time scales that are involved, they're exposed to cosmic radiation. And of course, we know that these are true extreme survival properties of bacteria are well known, well attested. Uh, within a deep frozen comet, of course, microbes are preserved indefinitely. Uh, but could a fraction of these survive after they get out into space? And the, and the answer is yes, we've recently found a bacteria surviving on the outside of the International Space Station, for instance bacteria and also known to survive and replicate within a working, a fully working nuclear reactor. So, and not every bacterium needs to survive the millions of years to go from one site of replication to another. It only takes, uh, requires something like one in 10 to the 20 to survive. And the process of cosmic, of the cosmic biosphere is very similar to the sowing of seeds in the wind. Few are destined to survive, but so many are the seeds that some amongst them do indeed survive. And viruses are even better survivors in a cosmic radiation environment because of their smaller sizes. Okay, let me just quickly go through these bacteria since I... Okay, uh, since we're talking about coronavirus and so on, I should make this... 
we predict, made a prediction as far back as 1981, is that if viruses are incidents from space, then evolution must also be driven from space. Viruses do not just attack the cells they enter. They may add, plac add placidly to one or other of the chromosomes. Viruses are in, our, in our genes provide the potential for the evolution of new life forms and also for diseases, as I'm going to say. So I'll skip this side because I'm running out of um, time. Uh, if you look at the, our own e evolution, the evolution of humans, of hominids, recent studies have shown that over 20% of the human genome is made up of viral sequences. And these viruses were inserted into our ancestral line through devastating pandemics of disease. Our own DNA carries this history of past pandemics. The evolution of hominids over a million years or millions of years was marked by a succession of viral pandemics from space. Each of these pandemics being a close call to almost total extinction, but at every point there is a small surviving cohort that is free to evolve and carries the relics of these viruses. So these are, in the picture below, there, there, there are lots of silent parts of our DNA, non-coding regions, and these are the relics of past uh, viruses. Uh, I must finish this with these uh, few slides because it's really relevant to what's happening today. So the question is, are microbes and viruses coming into the earth today? And the answer is a resounding yes. If comets brought the first life to earth 4.2 billion years, that couldn't have stopped. We still are in the midst of these cometary orbits, and so the Earth is going through this mess of comets. And uh, if you try to find out how much is coming in on a daily basis, we did that in 2001 uh, by sending balloons to 41 kilometers over Hyderabad, India, and we found a large number of bacteria, viruses, nanobacteria in the collected material. So I want to just quick, quickly skip these slides, but to show, tell you that the daily input of microbes amounts to 0.3 to 3 tons per day over the whole earth, and that's a huge amount. So 0.3 to 3 tons per day over the whole earth translates to 20,000 to 200,000 bacteria for every square meter every day. And this and the equivalent number of viruses are maybe a thousand times higher than that. And there's been recent experiments done on the peaks of the Sierra Nevada mountains, actually collecting stuff that is falling from the skies. And they have found in excess of 10 to the 9 per square centimeter a day of bacteria falling and 100 times more of viruses. So this is again a final slide or two. Uh, there was a space station discovery on the outside of the space station, of the International Space Station, between 2010 and 2016. And they found microorganisms and of course 400 kilometers is the height of the orbit and it's far too high for taking any stuff from the Earth. So it has to come from space. So to wrap up then, evolution of life could only have been accomplished in the context of a vast interconnected volume of the cosmos, a huge cosmic biosphere. Nothing of great innovative significance happened on the Earth. The Earth was just a simple receiving station, one of a hundred, maybe a few hundred billion similar receiving planets on the Earth for the cosmic edifice of life to take, uh, take hold. And the tree of life that we're all familiar with is just a reconstruction of a cosmically derived evolutionary scheme. Uh, so that's the uh, story and uh, I want to end with the statement that our cosmic biosphere, our cosmic microbiome must extend into space over billions and billions of light years. And our genetic ancestors therefore still lurk there amongst the stars. Thank you very much. I rushed through a lot, but I hope it... Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Chandra. Uh, yes, we have uh, a couple minutes for uh, some questions. Yeah. I've got a 
question here from uh, Kristen. Is there any evidence for primordial microbes in the first generation of stars? Well, no, because I think the, the, the observations that have been available, the astronomical observations have been very, very primitive still. Uh, at the present time, uh, biosignatures, if you want to look at uh, uh, actual biological structures, then even on our planets, it's a struggle to find evidence of microorganisms. Recently, Venus has been a focus of attention of a group of astronomers. They found a molecule, a small molecule called phosphine, which they think can only be produced by a living organism, a living microorganism. So we don't, at the moment, have the technology to to make that discovery of microorganisms in a distant star, around a distant star. We can just about see the evidence of planets, of Earth-like planets. And so the hope is that in the next, maybe with the next generation of space telescopes, we may be able to uh, detect signatures of biology or biochemistry on the surfaces of these exoplanets. But the, the hard evidence that I have presented to you in those uh, slides where there was curves uh, plotted against the points. And these are essentially infrared spectra of bacteria and viruses generally, not any particular type. So it's the generic uh, component of all living stuff all taken in one huge bundle if you throw it in space and ask what the spectrum is, the, infrared, the crude infrared spectrum, it does match the spectrum of bacteria and viruses. That's as much as you can say at the moment. Thank you, Chandra. Uh, we have another question from Danny. Is there any astrobiological evidence for non-CN-based life? Unfortunately, not. Non-carbon-based non based life, you're probably thinking of, of silicon-based life. It's, uh, it's been a speculation that if carbon can assemble into large variety, huge, in, or infinite variety of living forms, why not silicon? Silicon is also an atom that could be involved in lots and lots of different uh, uh, complex structures, that's, that's for sure, but not as many not as great a number as carbon. So carbon, I think, is more, is by far the most versatile of the elements, of the chemical elements, uh, for thinking about life. Well, on the other hand, I mean, silicon is, uh, if you can think of silicon chips, you can have, think of robots, robotic life forms, where, where, the, where carbon doesn't really enter in a very significant way. So maybe silicon-based life is robotic life. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one more question and then we uh, will close. How do you rectify saying uh, bacteria were found too high to come from Earth with this slide early in your talk mentioning that bacteria can be sent back into space from Earth? Yeah, that, well, that's true. I mean, the small numbers of bacteria are being thrown out from time to time. I mean, we, we have these... Uh, I mean, rockets and spacecraft going out of the Earth. And we know that some of these microorganisms can actually survive entry and exit through the atmosphere. So small, small numbers of microorganisms might be thrown out from space from time to time, but a steady flux that can essentially slap onto the, onto the windows of the International Space Station uh, seems to be a really... processes on the Earth, the most uh, enlightened of the atmospheric, uh, uh, atmospheric physicists I've been working with tell me that beyond maybe 100 kilometers, there's no chance of getting any life, microbial life from the Earth uh, lifted uh, in air currents out to the distance of the ISS, which is 400 kilometers. So that's, that's my answer. Oh, thank you, Chandra. Thank you so much for coming, uh, for uh, joining us here today. We are, uh, your talk was very interesting and um, 
uh, would like to encourage everybody to uh, take a look at Chandra's bio and uh, contact him if you have any questions. Yeah, Thank you, Chandra. Pleasure. Yeah. Our next presenter uh, has a passion for development and a drive for intellectual challenge. When you take a look at his full bio, you will agree that Gary is somewhat of a polymath, an individual whose knowledge spans a wide spectrum of disciplines. So with degrees in hospitality management, hotel administration, culinary arts, law, and space studies, Gary is the epitome of a continual learner. So it would come as no surprise that in addition to serving uh, as APUS's faculty director for the School of Business, Gary also hosts a weekly podcast called Intellectable. I would like to introduce Dr. Gary Deal. Well, thank you very much, Melissa. I appreciate that. Can you still hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you again for the very warm introduction and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, uh, as Melissa said, my name is Dr. Gary Deal. I am a uh, faculty director here with American Public University System, actually in the School of Business, um, but I've been a student and a hobbyist and an interested learner in space studies uh, for the better part of the last I guess five or so years um, and uh, thrilled to be here with you today uh, to talk a little bit about my background as a, a business person, as an entrepreneur and sort of how we might blend that uh, into the future um, in the world of, of space studies ahead. So um, I uh, admit that my PowerPoint presentation is not nearly as comprehensive or visually appealing as uh, Dr. Wickrama Singhase, but uh, I'll try to keep it brief and uh, we'll have more time for Q&A, so uh, bear with me. Are you, um, Melissa, able to see the slideshow at this moment or are you looking at the um, uh, PowerPoint file viewer? Uh, yes, it's a file viewer. Okay, bear with me one moment. Let me see if I can correct that. <clears throat> You want to just go up to slideshow. Yeah, there we go. Okay, perfect. I think that will get us there. Um, so again, uh, you know, my talk today is, is just a very brief overview of space entrepreneurship, where we are today and where I think we need to go. Um, so with that being said, um, space entrepreneurship has recently been coined uh, with sort of a, a new catchphrase as astropreneurship. Um, and it's grown tremendously uh, in the last few decades. If you look at the uh, the rate of, of progress and proliferation in the private sector for space entrepreneurship uh, in the early days of um, space exploration. So beginning in the 50s, all the way through the 60s and 70s with the Apollo missions and then on to the space shuttle. Um, there were private partners that developed different pizzas and uh, widgets for, you know, the, the governmental efforts, you know, in our case, keenly NASA. Um, but independent space companies um, are really sort of few and far between. Uh, but this second bullet point on this slide should give you some um, indication of the rate of growth. In 2011, there were approximately 125 independent space companies, and this would include contractors and, um, and, and companies of all kinds contributing to the efforts of space exploration, space infrastructure, space logistics, and so on. Uh, by 2016, just five years later, that number had grown about eightfold and uh, was at over a thousand. And um, most experts agree at this point that uh, between the years 2016 and 2026, uh, we'll see roughly another 10,000 of these companies um, be incepted, you know, in, in these coming years. And the last four years of that time has more or less followed that trend is to the best of my knowledge and data that we, we haven't seen this prediction that dates back to 2016, um, you know, be a, a significant deviation from what we've actually witnessed uh, in the last four of those 10 years. Now, when we talk about space entrepreneurship, most people tend to think of big, flashy, expensive things that um, frankly have very high barriers to entry. So space logistics is one of those key points. Uh, SpaceX uh, is probably the most notable, uh, one of Elon Musk's many companies, um, and obviously uh, most notable for some of the, the, the very flashy, entertaining things that they've done. Um, you know, Pivotal to that, of course, was the development of 
uh, reusable rocket launch vehicles uh, that land back on uh, soil or at, on the ocean on barges after being launched. And so to date, uh, SpaceX has uh, managed to do this, I believe, more than 50 times, and they are reusing some of their first stage boosters uh, three, four, five times at a clip. Um, so that's one of the, the biggest sort of uh, names on the scene that catches a lot of the headlines. Um, the Falcon Heavy rocket that they developed back in, I believe, 2018, if I'm not mistaken, was the first launch. And um, if, if for those of you who remember or follow the news at that time, Elon put his uh, first generation Tesla Roadster in the payload bay. Um, because of course, when you're testing a new rocket, you need some kind of payload. And um, so they decided to use a car to, uh, to generate news and buzz around this event. Uh, it normally would just be a, a block of concrete or some other weight to, to show that the rocket is capable of lifting a payload of a certain amount of weight into orbit, but uh, he decided to make it more interesting. And so that obviously caught a lot of news headlines. Um, Virgin Galactic is another example, and then they're not yet commercially operational, but this is uh, Sir Richard Branson's uh, brainchild company, spawning from all the other Virgin conglomerate uh, companies that he's developed. And uh, they're based out of a spaceport in New Mexico that has been partially subsidized by the government, uh, specializing in space tourism. So uh, aimed to be one of the first companies to allow uh, individuals, civilian individuals with no specific training or qualifications uh, to be able to go into space um, for a very, very short period of time. Uh, what's looking to be probably somewhere on the order of four to eight minutes of, of true weightlessness. This will be a parabolic uh, trajectory into space. So it's not something that will reach low earth orbit or any kind of sustainable orbit. It is strictly an up and down trip. Um, but the feeling and the experience in space for that period of time will be uh, virtually indistinguishable from those that are, you know, on board the space station or anything else that we sort of imagine. Um, it's not technically the first example of space tourism, um, because of course, if you go back uh, to the early years of the space station, uh, there were at least one or two billionaires who paid um, something on the order of 20 million, 30 million dollars uh, to ride aboard Russian spacecraft uh, to the space station and for no other reason than sort of the thrill of the experience. Uh, and so insofar as that qualifies as tourism, uh, we have to concede that, that that was the first, technically. Um, Virgin Galactic's ticket prices, uh, which are now on pre-sale if anyone's interested, last I checked, they were about a quarter million dollars a piece. Um, so certainly not a mass market commodity at this point. Um, but surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, I guess, depending on your perspective toward uh, this new industry, uh, they have somewhere in the order of, I think, a thousand pre-orders already, mostly obviously from wealthy individuals, very affluent people. Uh, who ambition to go into space. I know Leonardo DiCaprio is among that list. So uh, I'm not sure if the seats next to him are taken, but you can always call and ask. Um, and these are, of course, again, all theoretical pre-orders. Uh, unfortunately, they've had some setbacks in development and design. They had a fatal incident that occurred where um, it, it appears to have been a pilot error uh, on the spacecraft that resulted in a crash, uh, killing, um, I believe, two of the pilots aboard uh, the, uh, one of the test flights. Um, so that's another aspect of, of um, private sector space investment today. Uh, and then, of course, Blue Origin is Jeff Bezos' company, which is still in the startup phase, but planning to be a competitor in space logistics and, uh, and other aspects. So these are the companies making big headlines. And of course, again, to look at these on the outside, this is not something that the average person can get their teeth into if you don't happen to be a billionaire, because the, the, the barriers to entry, the cost to entry are extremely high. Um, but one of the points I wanted to make in this in this presentation is that it doesn't necessarily have to be space logistics and rocket launch vehicles for you to create uh, a space based company or to be a space entrepreneur. Um, and one example that I wanted to use an organization that I've uh, had some work with here in um, Orlando, Florida, is the University of Central Florida's Exolith Lab, um, which is a partially subsidized um, NASA sponsored organization. Um, and it's also partially subsidized by UCF and, and a few other um, involved partners. Um, but essentially the Exolith Lab, and you're welcome to Google it if you have any interest, but they make space dirt. Um, it's the best way I can describe it. Uh, for those companies that are doing research into things like rovers um, and soil composition and research missions that will touch down on celestial bodies in our solar system, um, the Exolith Lab offers the closest 
sort of analog to actual uh, moon dirt or Mars dirt uh, or what have you that we have available. And so um, the key thing to note about this is that what they do is not traditionally or, or, or typically extremely expensive. Um, they're not sending you rare earth elements. They're sending you rocks that were mined out of a, uh, you know, out of an underground mine in, in Colorado or in Idaho. Um, they're ground down to the certain micron size that is necessary to simulate what we know is the compositional material of say the moon. And we, we know the moon with a fair amount of precision because of the Apollo missions and the return samples. Um, when we talk about Mars dirt and we talk about even Phobos and Deimos dirt, which are the moons of Mars, um, we have a little bit less certainty as to the composition and the size in terms of the particle size and so on. But we can still use light spectroscopy to narrow down exactly what those compositional materials are made of and then speculate and use educated guesses to identify what, what it might be like, right? If you were walking on Mars, would it be sandy? Would it feel rocky? Would it feel like a clay material? Um, and we've developed these simulants. Uh, that's what we call them. Um, and they're not terribly expensive. You can buy a kilogram for, I think, about 25 bucks. Um, so they're great for a science classroom. Or if you're, again, if you're NASA or some other private contractor that's building a huge rover to go to Mars, uh, you might need a couple tons of this stuff. And uh, so it does require expertise and knowledge, but it doesn't require tremendously high barriers to entry, um, at least not like the previous examples I mentioned. Um, here's the thing about space entrepreneurship. Uh, it's, it's hard, right? Space exploration is hard. Space investment is hard. And, and by hard, I, I mean difficult and challenging and uncertain. Um, there's no working model, right? Everything that we're talking about in terms of space-based business, other than satellite communications, right, that have been around for 50, 60 years, um, it's all theoretical and prototypical, right? There, there's really nothing out there to say, look, it's already been done before. So there's very little certainty. Um, profitability is the same way, right? Even though we can look at asteroids and, and again, use spectroscopy to determine that there are high contents, for example, of rare earth elements on asteroids orbiting in our solar system. And we can say, well, geez, if, if we could lasso one of those and then mine it, uh, we, we can make a tremendous amount of money for the platinum and the other elements that are of high value on the earth. But again, how much money it will take, how much investment, what cost it will take us to actually get there. We've never done it before. Um, and of course, the dangers are tremendous, right? So uh, whenever we're involved with human-based spaceflight, you know, will people die? As, as Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson says, probably, right? In any space-based venture, even Elon Musk, who obviously built his company SpaceX around the ultimate ambition of colonizing Mars, um, you know, he said, quite frankly, people will probably die uh, on this, uh, you know, on this venture to create a sustainable human colony on Mars. Um, it's unfortunate, but given how difficult this kind of thing is and how uncertain the challenges are, um, tremendous risks are to be expected. So with that in mind, um, investment in entrepreneurialism in space can't be built around the, the typical historical profit and risk mitigation motives that drive most companies, right? Where's the risk the lowest and where's the profit the highest? That just won't work here because if you play by those rules, nobody will invest in space ever. Um, the focus has to instead be on the need to accelerate human progress and safeguard the future of our species on objectives that, that go beyond the desire to reach the bottom line and to please shareholders, right? Which is one of the reasons, incidentally, by why a lot of companies like Elon Musk, SpaceX have not gone public yet, um, because they know that as, insofar as investors are concerned, this is really speculative, right? And it's really def difficult to bring venture capitalists with serious money to this without a bottom line guarantee. Um, and so this is my last slide of substance, and it's just to identify several of the opportunities that abound in space entrepreneurship. So space logistics, we talked about. Again, if, if you have a few billion dollars and you'd like to start a rocket company, by all means, but it's a difficult thing to do if you don't have that initial startup capital. Um, but outside of that, uh, research and investment into propulsion technologies, ways to get us to and from the places we want to go faster, um, a lot faster. You know, the best engines that we have today, the best propulsion tech can get us to Mars and in maybe about six months. And we're looking at some other technical prototypical concepts that might shorten that trip to a few weeks. Um, but we really need to make major advances if we're going to look at colonization and exploration of the solar system in mass uh, in a more efficient way. Life support systems on board spacecraft, uh, artificial gravity, right? Being able to uh, generate that because we know how important that is to, to health and wellness of our astronauts that in microgravity, we immediately begin to deteriorate. And so we can't withstand that exposure for very long, right? Particularly for long missions that go well beyond the scope of the earth and the moon. 
um, and then colonization elsewhere, right? This, this should be a prime directive for us, given the fact that uh, the next major impact that could be a, an extinction level event on the earth is completely uncertain, right? We know that these don't happen very often, but they happen often enough that we have a geological record of it. And, um, you know, our, our survival as a species should be paramount to everything else. And so we've obviously talked about Mars. Venus is another example. And the picture on this slide is an example of a, uh, a prototype concept called Havoc, the high altitude vehicle operational concept. I may be getting the acronym wrong, but it was a proposal um, within NASA to launch uh, essentially blimps on Venus because although the surface of Venus is terribly hostile to uh, Earth life as we know it, too hot, acid rain, pressure's crazy high, um, there are places within the atmosphere on Venus where if you could stay at a certain altitude, the temperature and the pressures are comfortable, you'd have access to elements that would help you to survive. So this is a workable concept and Venus is uh, nearer to us than Mars is, right? So there, there, there are opportunities there if we look at that as an option. So habitats, food, water, air, uh, radiation protection, which is a big deal in, in orbit and everywhere else, especially when you get outside of the Van Allen radiation belts and you're exploring the solar system and psychological health, right? Keeping people healthy aboard uh, ships, which involves communication and entertainment and uh, everything that we know about that science as a whole. So um, lots to do here and lots of ways that people can participate. So my encouragement um, before we turn to Q&A is just to say, uh, you know, don't be bashful and, and don't think that you need a billion dollars or many billion dollars to be able to contribute in this space. Uh, you can contribute in a smaller way by choosing a niche area like that and exploring it. So that's me. Thank you, Gary. Absolutely. Yes, Hopefully that was short, good on time. We, we have a lot <laughs> to think about and do. <laughs> Let's open it up for questions. <clears throat> Isn't, isn't space colonization uh, limiting in the way that we can explore beyond the solar system, certainly? Uh, are you hearing me? Yes. I'm hearing you. Okay. Uh, beyond the solar system, mm -hmm. I mean, think of the nearest, uh, nearest habitable planet. It probably would take um, a couple of human generations, maybe a dozen human generations to reach the next uh, colonizable habitat. So would you think that uh, these technologies that you described could be extended to uh, have a sort of a spaceship where human beings reproduce for thousands of years in the hope of some future generation of the guys in the spaceship reaching their destination? Or would they give up even with the thought of that? I think there is a strong possibility that if you work through the process intellectually, you would decide that this is not the way that you want to colonize anywhere. I mean, you talked about colonizing the planets in our solar system. That's, that's fine because that can be done within a human lifetime. It's a tedious journey and there are, as you said, lots of hazards and so on, but it is certainly doable and it almost certainly would be done in the next uh, 50 years. But beyond that, I think there are limitations that would be quite serious for us and for the likes of us elsewhere, right? If you think of human type civilizations elsewhere, would they really, and this sort of comes to the Fermi paradox idea, if there are so many of us around there, why haven't they come here? And the answer may be that they have worked through intellectually, the possibilities that this is, this is really a bizarre prospect of being stuck in a spaceship for thousands of years in the hope that your distant offspring reach your destination. Instead, what they might do is to, uh, is to package all of their DNA information into little, little particles and just fling them out into space. And uh, in other words, sowing their seeds into space in the hope that those seeds would take root somewhere. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think that's conceivable. I, you know, the Fermi paradox is an interesting one and, and there's many theories, you know, some argue that perhaps the reason why we've not seen or heard from anyone else is that there's nothing really of interest here yet, you know, to, to <laughs> cultivate a conversation yeah, um, yeah. because we don't have an appreciation for how insignificant we, we are as a species in our development. But, um, you know, I'm not necessarily stating an opinion on that. I, I think I've written several articles on the concept of interstellar travel. I think that 
there's really three ways to do it. One of them is what you described. Uh, you know, if we use current propulsion technology is the best that we have today, you know, the fastest spacecraft that, that we can offer, it would take us on the order of 70,000 years to reach the nearest uh, Alpha yeah, Centauri yeah. or Proxima yeah. Centauri. And so, um, you know, that's one option. One option is just to, to, to move slowly and plan to procreate a lot, right, on board to yeah. have a multi-generational space mission. Um, another option is to... Um, develop the medical technology sufficient to allow us to live a lot longer. And, and maybe that's some sort of cybernetic merging of, you know, the, the consciousness with something that doesn't wither and, and age and die the way biological bodies do. Um, I think the, the, the most straightforward route and perhaps the, the lowest hanging fruit there is uh, advances in spacecraft propulsion that allow yeah. us to go a lot, lot faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, the nearest stars to our own are, um, roughly four light years, which means that if you could travel at light speed, it would take you roughly four years to to reach that that point. Um, if you could travel at a fraction, a significant fraction of light speed, because as far as we know, the laws of physics prevent us from traveling at light speed, but nothing theoretically prohibits us from traveling near light speed. So, you know, if we could cut that trip down to say five years or six years, well, we still have problems with longevity and making sure that the the, the trip is is one that humans can survive in a healthy way, radiation exposure, microgravity, that kind of thing. But, but it could conceivably it could with you. Yeah. Well, and that's the, that creates other problems because of course, Einstein's time dilation says yeah. that, you know, if you come back, it will unfortunately have been several centuries uh, yeah. that will have gone by on earth while you were gone for four or five years. So everyone you ever knew cared about loved will have long since been dead. Um, but you know, if, if you're willing to weather those costs, um, yeah. there are ways to do it. So yeah. there are definitely hurdles to overcome, but I, I think yeah. it's doable. And I think in the immediate term, the priority should be not necessarily interstellar. I mean, we should not, ignore that but the immediate term is colonization of really any other celestial body so that if something catastrophic here happens on the earth which we know with certainty has happened before yeah, look, yeah. look at the chicxulub okay. crater and the dinosaurs and extinction level events there so there, there's no reason for us to think that we're immune to that threat in the future Absolutely, yeah. yeah so the question is just a matter of when and uh, I think for that reason, we should assume that it will be soon. And, and with that in mind, yeah. you know, prepare immediately for, uh, you know, full speed ahead to try to colonize either Venus or Mars, the moon, uh, conceivably the moon, although it's the closest by far, is really not very well conducive to, to Earth life because you just don't have anything there that, um, you know, that, that makes it easy. So it's almost more worthwhile to go further and, and find a place that is a little bit more uh, suitable for Earth life. Yeah, Mars is is, is the nearest uh, realistic possibility, isn't it? For for land based colonization, I would agree. But for for um, colonization period, I, I would not discount the option of Venus because the okay. habit concept seemed to have died on the table due to uh, political arguments about okay. you know, which teams would be involved and whatnot. But um, it would seem to me, in having researched this pretty extensively, that. Uh, you have the temperature and the pressure that, that's necessary to sustain life in, in orbit, essentially, or in the atmosphere of Mars, mm -hmm. or excuse me, in, on Venus. And you mm -hmm. have access to uh, the, the circumstances to regenerate plant life and, and to create water and, and breathable air. Um, yeah. Those are the, the major things that you need to accomplish. And if you can do all that, then there's no real reason you have to be on terra firma, you know, so yeah, to speak. No, 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 you could have a sort of whole lot, lot of orbiting uh, sort of resident planet spacecraft, isn't it, at, at the orbit of uh, what forty kilometers above the surface? Uh, exactly, like a exactly flotilla. like a flotilla. Like a flotilla, right? Yeah, okay, very it's a okay, fantastic you. talk. Thank you. Likewise, thank you. Likewise, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, gentlemen, very much. Uh, I hope we get to see you next year at next year's CISA conference. Likewise. <laughs> thank you. Well, please stay with us. We have, uh, we have more, lots more. Coming up next, we have session three on space policy and law at noon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.